pulled in a four hour period, believe it or not, to get through the entire bird. I've been working on this for a, a very long time, um, longer than I like to admit. In fact, if you look at my, uh, it always uh, surprises me when I look at pictures like yesterday and I forget to shave. I've way too much white in my beard now. Um, it used to be very, very, I, I started working on this when I was in 1999, so very, very long time ago. Um, and so what I've tried to do um, in uh, talking to Sebastian a little bit about uh, um, what the, the group here might find most useful is um, I think what we'll do is we will try and hit um, some things that I think are important for uh, the international community, uh, specifically around what happens when you, uh, very quickly, what happens when you first start a project, uh, because there are some assumptions that the tool makes. Uh, specifically about um, how it's going to handle diacritics uh, that actually can have an impact on how your system indexes those diacritics. Specifically co-op systems, which I've been told. Um, and since you're not in the United States, you have a little more flexibility than I do uh, in terms of how you handle your diacritics. Um, but we'll talk about that. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about um, doing uh, things like character conversions. Uh, I'm not sure how often you deal with um, getting how often you get files in um, other encodings. I deal with encodings from Asia, uh, so I get materials in local scripts that I have to convert to Unicode. Um, there are ways to do that. We'll talk through a little bit about that. And then what I've done is I've taken some questions that I get um, over the, the course of um, uh, I get often um, on the listserv, and I move through those kind of same questions. Uh, and the reason I'm doing it this way is the market has a lot of different ways to do things. And so this way we can kind of go over different approaches to answering different questions. Um, that'll include talking about regular expressions at the beginning, very lightly, but um, the kind of uh, regular expressions that you will see most often. We have three examples to kind of uh, to start with because we will um, uh, use them periodically throughout the process. Um, and then at the end, we will talk a little bit about um, how you can automate the tool using um, scripts. Marketit has always been developed as um, a tool that can be coded to. Um, I very rarely use the interface myself. Um, I actually write programs against the libraries that Marketit uses, and there's a little engine that will generate uh, either Perl or um, uh, TV script for you to so automate the uh, the application. Um, there's also a command line tool that you can use um, that works uh, well on, on various systems. We're going to, I think, all be working on Windows. Market it uh, works um, on Linux, Windows, and um, the Mac operating system. I've been spending the last year trying to port the application so that it works um, on um, the uh, uh, OS X. It's getting fairly close to being. Um, uh, uh, the, the parity between the versions are getting closer, it's not complete, um, but it's getting there and I, I continue to work on that. Uh, so can I move off of, great, I will uh, go back to the beginning here, and we will go right. So I'm calling this real world uh, data editing and mark edit. So what I would love to have happen um, is for it. So, like I said, I've, I've created C questions. These are kind of questions that I've, I've put together to, um, that I think will help represent different editing techniques in the program. But I'm hoping you guys came with questions. And actually, if you have questions, that is actually better than me having questions. Uh, so, uh, so it, as we're going through this, I would, I'm, I'm hoping that maybe uh, uh, if things come up, please stop me. Uh, please ask. And if there's questions that you specifically have right now that you want to make sure to get answered, I would love to hear those so we can make sure that we, we get through that. So I'll let you think about it. All right, so like I said, the things I'm going to do will demonstrate some real-world application utilizing the data, um, uh, some targeted demonstrations of how to use the applications, editing techniques in the Mark Editor, um, as well as um, some of the functionality there that is probably not well known. Um, there's, a, there's some fairly new tools that have been added, um, specifically for helping to build um, uh, new fields that are structured out of lots of information from your records. Um, and so those are kind of there, and then opportunities to ask questions, and, and hopefully that'll, 
that will take us through um, the that will take us through the, the three four hours. If I do this right, we'll finish somewhere around three and a half hours, which at this point is probably will will be getting up to lunch. Um, if I if I talk a little faster, which I'm going to try to avoid, um, then we'll finish maybe a little earlier. But we'll see. All right. So the first thing I wanted to talk about um, is what happens the very first time you run Marquette because. Uh, for an American audience, MarkEdit is configured um, to work for Mark 21 and all the assumptions that a North American audience would use. So one of the things that you need to know about MarkEdit is MarkEdit is Mark agnostic. It does not believe in a flavor of Mark. Um, it does that purposefully. It's actually a design characteristic. Otherwise, I couldn't use it with you, Mark. I could use it with Thin Mark. I could use it with Thin Mark. There's something in the name that have like 46 different flavors of Mark. National flavors of Mark, and if I tied it to Mark 21, then if you don't use Mark 21, you couldn't use Mark Edit. Uh, Mark Edit doesn't also care about the rules. All it cares about is that the structure is roughly the, the right the right place, um, and so that means that for libraries, and there are a number of them in the United States that create Mark records for events. So, like I have a a talk, I have a conference going on. I'm going to put that in my catalog. You can do that in Mark Edit. Um, I want to work with my authority records. You can work with authority records in Marquette. It's just about the mark structure is all, all of you cares about. However, that means that uh, there are some options that if you are a non Mark 21 user, you want to set um, because there are some, some data elements that need to be set when you're doing character conversions from like Mark 8 to Unicode. It's a little bit of the computer button book that, that your your uh, your record is in a particular language. Um, and there's also things that have to do with diacritics. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to, um, this, I'll do this a lot, I'm going to jump in and out of my slides. Um, and we're going to go through uh, very quickly um, what happens the very first time when you when you run Marquette. And there's a pretty good chance that when you, if you open Marquette now, it may actually prompt you to do this. I don't know if they went through the process of, um, uh, of going through kind of a first run. And so I'm going to bounce out because it's going to just be easier for me to do it this way. And I think it'll be easier to see too. All right, so the preferences are this little uh, this little blue box in the corner. And when you run Mark Edit for the first time, you get, uh, you get this window. All right, so, so the first thing about the tool is you get to decide what the front page looks like. Um, you can check off whichever of these uh, these little things, these little icons that you use most often. Those will be the ones that show up on your front page. I like to mention that because a lot of times people screenshot the front page and then they'll tell me that theirs doesn't look like mine, and it's because I pick different programs than you do. Um, so, so you can pick any of these that are here. All right, the ones that are most important probably um, to to you as a as a as an international community, I would guess. Um, have to do with uh, with with a couple of options. Um, the most important of those is probably um, this one here uh, that's under the Mark Engine. Uh, so the Mark Engine um, specifically is the kind of brains behind how Mark Edit um, understands Mark reference. Uh, now remember, Mark Edit is Mark agnostic, so it's reading the format. But in order to do certain things, uh, it has to guess or, or make some assumptions about what your record types are. So Mark 21 in the leader is where we set bytes about you know whether or not your data is in Mark 8 or Unicode. In Unimark, I think it's in the two something. No, I'm not a Unimark person, so people tell me that. So so anyway, so you have you have these places where you have assumptions that get made. And so what happens here is this is a place where you kind of tell Mark Edit what assumptions it can make and what assumptions it can't make. Um, the first two are ones that are, are I tell the folks in the North American audience never change uh, because they probably shouldn't. Um, the general option of use diacritics when breaking and records in Mark 21 products. We always wear Mark 21 products. We don't even use Mark in, in, in the United States. Um, and so if you're a Mark 21 user, um, or uh, UK Mark, or any of those kind of ones that kind of all you know groups together at one point, we're all fairly related. Does that make sense? The the use diacritics when breaking um, in Mark Edit, you uh, 
uh, if you use it, or you're familiar with the little brackets that represent diacritics, that's essentially what it's telling to do, is to use those diacritics when breaking. Uh, there's a reason for doing that. When you work um, in uh, a local script, for example, so let's say you are a user in um, Asia and you use the Big Five format, you can turn that off and work on uh, Mark Edit in the Big Five format. And the tool will, will, will work just fine that way. We'll, we'll look at that here in a second. Um, there's a little bit of configuration that has to happen. Uh, the other options have to do with how Mark Edit handles XML data. So Mark Edit handles XML data. When you install it, by default, you get access to Mark XML translations, to uh, FGDC, which is a GIS data format, uh, Dublin Core. Um, there's a I think there's, what, about seven or eight that, that come by default. And you can add more. And in fact, that's the idea, is that Mark Edit was designed so that you can add your own um, XML conversions, rather than me having to keep adding them for you. Um, a lot of the stuff that's added to Mark Edit is templates. And so um, the, 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 the XML options here tell Mark Edit how it's going to translate data from Mark XML um, into the mnemonic format. And there's two ways to do it. Uh, the first one, um, which is in this little text box, points to an XSLT style sheet that translates Mark XML data into Mark Edit's mnemonic format. And that's one that you can actually customize and change the way that data translates from Mark XML to Mark. So if you want to change that, that process, you can actually update it there. Um, if you check the native option, which is the one that uh, this, this button right here, you check this button, that actually stops using the XSLT and it uses what's called a Saxon process, which is an event-based process that allows market to work with really, really, really big files. Um, the, that's the trade-off. Um, if you use the, if you use, if you don't, if you leave this option unchecked, the native option, you start to be constrained uh, by the amount of memory that you have on your machine. Because in order for this process to work, it has to load the entire file into memory. It validates it, and then it translates it. When it uses, when that option is checked, it does no validation. It validates as it reads each block. And so the reason that exists is because the Hadi Trust, which is a, a, a group that uh, is in the United States that is um, uh, the kind of the curator of the Google Books projects uh, was working with an institution, and they were that institution was doing some data analysis, and they gave them a file, uh, something in the neighborhood of 600 megabytes. It was a Mark XML file, so I you can't work with that big of a file, um, and so that's why this is here. It allows you to break that down very quickly. Um, the the last option is the one that I think. Um, the, these two options down below are the ones that I think are probably the ones that, um, as Co-I users, at, at least this is what I've been told in the past from co users outside of the United States, that may be most interest to you. So in the United States, um, we get constrained by what the Library of Congress tells us. Um, and the Library of Congress tells us that we really want to be able to move from Mark 8 to Unicode and Unicode back to Mark 8. And because of that constraint, we have to use what's called um, the KD notation. So a lot of you guys probably are much more familiar with it. Um, in the United States, a lot of people don't realize that when you say Unicode, UTF-8, um, that you actually, that there are lots of flavors of that. That it's not just UTF-8. Um, and that's essentially what we're talking about here. Um, in the United States, we use a flavor that looks an awful lot like Mark-8. Uh, Mark-8. Uh, which is the, the character format we use, you have a letter, so let's say an A, and a diacritic that modifies it, and there are two, two bytes, and they get represented together. Um, in the flavor of unit code that we use, we have the diacritic and the letter, and still two bytes, and so they get combined together by the computer system for, for display purposes, but for indexing purposes, we index the diacritic, uh, which is unfortunate. Um, if you don't want to work that way, um, and you have that flexibility, you can use what's called the canonical composition. And if you check that option, mark it by default will take those two bytes and turn them into a single byte. So there is, in Unicode, a, a, an actual character that represents an A with the diacritic over it. And you can then 
index as the A of the diacritic over it. Um, like I said, in the United States, we don't have that flexibility. We can't turn that on because um, in order to work within our environments, we have to be able to round trip between Markdate and Unicode because there's still a lot of libraries for some odd reason that are stuck in Markdate and very few libraries that are um, in Unicode. Um, now, I should say, um, in Markdate, or in Markedit, if you have the canonical composition set, that C notation set, you still can round trip your data from Unicode back to Markedit. Markedit does something in the background. When it looks at your Unicode data, it asks, it makes, a, it makes an evaluation to see what normalization you're using. And if you're using a normalization that is not the LC prescribed normalization, it will change it on the fly, turn it into the LC normalization, and then translate it to market. So you work with you libraries in the United States, and they're stuck in the, the having to do it the way the Library of Congress wants you to do it. You can actually still send data back and forth and use this canonical notation, which is probably better if you're a Koha user, what I understand. Um, so that's important to them. The other one that I will just point to, because we'll look at it a little bit later, uh, is this one here, uh, the ILS integration. So I'm, I'm not sure, I think maybe most people here use it. Um, if not, then, then this will be, uh, we will get to hear about what it says. So MarkEdit has, uh, I've been starting to, one of the things I think about when I work with MarkEdit is MarkEdit lives in a very large sphere of obviously software that's been created in libraries. It's not going to be the only thing you're going to use. In fact, it's probably going to be just one small part of the, 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 the tools that you use. And so what I try and do is I try and provide ways to integrate with other tools as, as best I can. Um, and this is one of those, those opportunities. So the, the co-op community very early on um, asked if there was a way that we could use MarkEdit directly with the co-op system. And this is how you turn it on. Um, the, the, and I think this may even work with Evergreen. I'm not positive about that. Um, I've done some conversations with, um, with other proprietary systems like Innovative and Ex Libris. The problem is it's difficult to work with them when you're not a customer. Um, so, so those kind of things happen where if those integrations happen because somebody um, specifically who is a customer acts as a liaison between me and them. Koha is much easier though. So in order to use this, you, you check the little button that says enable it, you can select Koha, and then you fill in the information about your system. So the host name is going to be the information that points to the URL to your system. And that's going to tell MarkEdit to use your, the API that lives in the background. And what that does is it allows you to update, create, and I believe Maybe even delete, I can't remember uh, the entire, I can't remember if the API or the entire set of fraud operations. I know it's update and delete and add, update and add um, bibliographic and item data into the co -op system. Uh, and you can do that through the API. Um, you can also search, and search happens through Z39.50 because uh, you don't have a dedicated search API um, in co -op, which I'd rather have. Um, but, uh, but you search through Z39.50, so you can figure your Z39.50 settings. Um, but once you do that, uh, you can then use MarkEdit actually as your editor for Koha. Um, you just basically search for your record or create a new record and post them up through there. So um, you can continue to use the editor in Koha. You can use the editor outside of Koha. And um, and I um, if uh, if when we get a little further down, I, I'll, I'll talk a little bit, I'll point a little bit more about that. Um, I don't know what, do folks here use OCLC? Is that, okay, I'm never sure. In the United States, this is a discussion we would have, so not so much here, good. All right, so um, I guess before we finish, two things I want to also point out, um, because they're important. Um, the two options here, uh, locations and other. Um, locations, Again, Mark Edit, very agnostic, tries not to set things up. Um, you have ways to share uh, tasks, so automated little programs. Um, in Mark Edit, uh, there's this place where you can point to a network folder that lives in your network, and everybody then can share the same resources. That happens in this location set. Um, also, if you're working on very, very big projects, 
Um, and I've done this before where I have, um, I work with, with libraries where I may get 30 to 40 million records. Um, Marketic keeps temporary files, so I want those temporary files to not live on my solid state drive because I don't want to use up the space. I can plug in another drive and tell Marketic the temporary directory now is over here for now. So use that as my temporary space, and then when I'm done, I can change it back. Um, so all that happens in these, uh, these file permissions, uh, the locations. The other is where you tell MarkEdit about your record. So remember, MarkEdit is Mark agnostic. It knows nothing about what's the title, what's the call number, what's an author. doesn't know anything about that. doesn't care. They're just numbers. Um, you have to tell it what those are. And so by default, it sets itself up to assume Mark 21. But you can go in here and change what a title is, and I would recommend that you're not using Mark 21, you definitely want to do that. Uh, what an author, what a call number, what a control number is. And then one of the things I've been trying to deal with, and I'm not sure if this is a problem here, but boy, it kills me in Mark 21, is these 880 fields. Do you deal with 880 fields? Do you, if, if I get confusion, then yes, all right. So in the United States, the way we deal with um, multiple languages is we use these fields that link them to the U.S. to the, to the English equivalents, and they're just they, they they kill me because they they're hard to follow. And so um, the way that Mark Edit decides whether or not it's going to do anything with that data is in these options here. Um, if you don't work with them, then I uh, first uh, uh, very happy for you. Um, <laughs> but that's where you would deal with that stuff is in that space. All right. So we make our we 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 we. So when Mark Edit first run, when you first install it, this box pops up. A lot of people are just going to push OK, which is unfortunate because then Mark Edit is going to assume you're working with Mark 21. If you're, uh, if you're not, this is how you get to the point of actually being able to customize it to do various things. All right, so we'll start with that. All right, now we'll Ah, uh, one thing I had, I, I did want to mention because this comes up. Uh, sorry, I, I'll go back one more thing. Um, Mark Edit is made. Um, I, I I will admit up front, I am not a user experience person, and so I build the tool based on the way I like to look at it. And so I build them with tiny tiny little box. Um, I, I uh, the the program is configured to work on a, a nine point font. Um, I get told all the time that that's too small, uh, and so. Um, what you can do here in the language option is change the font size, uh, and it will then um, resize the application windows so that uh, the font size actually is for people who want bigger fonts. Um, the other thing that you can do is change the font. So Mark Edit by default picks the Unicode font. Um, it tries to pick uh, Arial Unicode if you have it installed, but if you don't, it's going to pick probably Arial because that's probably within the same family. Um, or whatever the default system is, um, you pick that and then go with that. So the other thing I've been trying to do, and this is a great audience to talk about this because um, I've been looking for for people to be able to do this. Uh, I am I am, I have if you've listened to me talk here, I have hard enough time English. Um, I I, uh, I I certainly should not be doing translations um, and and couldn't even if I wanted to. Uh, but I do recognize that there are folks who are working in other languages where um, English is a barrier. And so what I've been starting to do is I have this process that I go through um, where I run through every now and again, and I, I take the application, all the streams in it, I send it to Google Translate, to Microsoft Translate Engine, I translate them, and then I, I put in um, a package of things here that then allow you to uh, pick um, the language, and it will then update uh, as appropriate. Um, where it can uh, the language in the, in the application. Now this is an automated translation, so it's blurry. I've been told, uh, but uh, there are folks, um, particularly French um, ones, uh, that have taken those files because they're just XML files and gone through translating them, fix them, uh, and then they send them back to me. I put them in here, and then they get used. Uh, if you um, happen to want to do that, uh, and I would be super excited if you did. Um, <laughs> because it's not going to happen any other way, unfortunately. Um, you can find all of the language files. Let me go back to English so I can see it. Uh, the language files actually live in a space. It's under Help, Application Shortcuts, Language Data, and they live here. There's this uh, set of XML files of all the ones that the computer automatically translates. 
Um, and you can go in and actually update those language files and send it to me. And I will send it to everybody else. I will put it in the marker and then what happens is when I run the new file, Mark edit checks to see, oh, some, somebody's translated this. I don't I don't want to do the machine to translate it for me. So I, I trust that we've done a better job than I will. And it'll only translate the parts that um, aren't there. So so that's actually, this is probably the best part for that because um, uh, I, I, I don't get many takers in the US to, to do that stuff. All right, we talked about that. And that, and that. Oh, um, yeah. Uh, as we're working with this, you may see a thing that, that pops up that asks you to update Mark Edit. Don't update Mark Edit. Um, it'll take too long for everybody to download it. Um, you can actually turn that off if you want to in the preferences. Uh, I do this because it makes my life easier um, if everybody knows when there are updates. Um, but there is a little update box, and you can check this button here that says automatically check for updates. By default, it's always checked, and that that actually does some things for me. Um, I'll just let you know what it does for me. One, it means that um, I have everybody hopefully on kind of relatively good versions of Mark Edit, so that when people ask me questions, I know that um, that I, when I answer it, I probably are going to be answering a question um, in a way that's going to help them. Uh, the other thing it does for me is um, I do Mark Edit in my free time. Uh, this is not my job. Uh, in fact, I work so far away from cataloging. Now, I used to be a cataloger, but I, I don't now. My my actual work is in, in data preservation. I do this because I enjoy it. Uh, this is this is what I like to do. Uh, it's my hobby. And so, um, one of the things that's very useful for me is knowing who's using the program. Um, and I know that partly by looking at my logs. I don't know who's using it, but I can tell how many people are using it. I know there's roughly about twenty thousand people who are actively using the program because when I post an update, that's me. How many people update? Um, I know that uh, over the course of the year, I can guess about how many unique users test the program uh, because I get to see how many updates happen over the course of that year. And I can then break it down by geographic area and see which geographic areas are kind of using it. So I can focus on finding people who maybe do languages in those spaces to help that particular community. So one of the places I'm trying to do this with is the Middle East. There are a surprising number of Middle Eastern users. Um, and because of that, I've tried to do some stuff to help folks who do right to left, um, yeah, right to left uh, entry to, to make it easier working with Mark. It's really hard to do that in, in a lot of Mark programs. So, so those kind of things are helpful. Um, if you don't want me to know that you're using the program, just don't check that box and download it, and, and then it's not, you know, it's not a big deal. Um, but that's that's what that that does, and that's what's useful. All right, so that's that stuff. All right, so let's start with let's start getting into stuff. All right, so one of the most um, uh, one of the things that probably uh, is the most useful part of, of the application, uh, at least in my opinion, because this is how it's probably part of every answer that I give when somebody asks an answer question, is regular expressions. So Mark Edit has its own flavor of regular well, not its own flavor. It uses um, it uses Microsoft's .NET um, regular expressions, which is Different. Um, that's probably what most people are used to. Uh, most people are used to probably Perl's um, syntax, I would guess. It's very Perl like with some notable differences, especially when it comes to back references. Um, what I try and do when I talk to folks about Mark Edit's regular expressions um, is try to show folks what are the pieces that are going to get used most often. There are certain characteristics of the regular expression language. That are just going to get reused over and over again. If you can master these, maybe like six or seven pieces of it, you're going to be able to do almost everything that you need to do with it. And so that's what we're going to look at those those pieces. The other thing I would like to point out is regular expressions are all about trial and error. I have examples here, and I've written them out because I screw them up sometimes, even though they're really simple. Uh, that we're going to go through. We'll go through three examples. Um, one of the things I've tried to do with Mark Edit. Um, and if you do regular expressions, you will see this, is when you're in the mark editor and the place where regular expressions get used most often um, are in the find and replace, because that's the only place where you have access to all of um, the data in your file, um, you will notice that these are not just plain text boxes. There's a little drop-down box here. And that's because mark edit remembers what are the last things you did 
um, when you are doing your, your replacements. And that's specifically for folks who are trying to sort through regular expressions because the number of times that I don't get it right uh, first time is almost every time. And so this way, I don't have to recreate it every time I start. I can pick what I did last time and then fix it and then go on. And it remembers both the last regular expression that I tried to run as well as the replacement. So again, regular expressions are not just about the pattern that I'm going to use to find the data, but the pattern that I'm going to use to replace the data. And so I would like to actually remember both of those. So that way, when I do stuff, if I screw it up, I, I'm able to, to go and fix it. All right, so back to our world of regular expressions. So in Microsoft, regular expression language, we have um, character escapes, anchors, character classes, groupings, qualifiers, and substitutions. Uh, there is a URL in your slides, and hopefully if they downloaded those, if not, I will send them out also um, uh, so you can have these as well. Uh, this is a kind of a quick, um, uh, quick, 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 quick reference. That's what I'm looking for. Quick reference to regular expressions. They have lots of examples um, in, in how they work. Um, for Microsoft.NET Framework, if you read it, you will find the notable exceptions to where the regular expressions don't work the way you might think they should. Um, that's what it's useful for. So these are the concepts, the general concepts that are there. Character escapes, anchors, um, character classes, blah, blah, blah. The ones that are most important to you, um, working with Mark Edit, are basically these ones here. In the character escapes, we have uh, slash D, which stands for digits. That's going to be numbers. If you want to represent numbers, you can use that, that shorthand. Um, slash R and slash N are returns of new lines. Those are important if you're going to create multiple fields out of something. Um, uh, slash dollar sign is a literal dollar sign. Um, unfortunately, dollar signs have lots of different meanings in regular expressions. Um, and you're going to use an escape to tell if I actually want a literal dollar sign, it's either going to be a slash dollar sign or double dollar sign. We're going to look at those. Um, they, they get kind of crazy. Um, and then in, in .NET, and this is frustrating, um, when you want to deal with Unicode data, you have to interact with it as um, its actual number. So the, 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 you can't just put a Unicode value in. You have to know the value number, so the, the actual um, hexadecimal code in the background, which is incredibly frustrating um, in regular in .NET regular expression. And so that's what that slash x um, two number signs is for, is to represent the number. There are some ways to work around that, but they're very difficult. So this tends to be the, the easiest way to deal with that, that problem. Um, character classes. This is where you get to ask for ranges of things. Um, and those get used all the time. So those are in brackets. If you want to use a bracket as a regular character, you have to escape it. So that's with the slash and then a bracket. But in this case, we're going to use classes. Um, brackets. Bare brackets are going to be a range of characters, 0 through 9, A through B, A through Z. Um, brackets with a little caret inside are um, matches that don't have those characters. And you will see in examples where I do that. I say I want everything up to the dollar sign. That way I can take an entire subfield that way to try and figure out where it starts and ends. So it's a really handy thing to have. Grouping elements. So when you work with a regular expression, uh, my philosophy is you break it down into statements. I'm trying to break down my big long set of fields, my big field, into small chunks. And then those chunks are what I'm going to do things with. And the way that you represent those chunks are in the parentheses. The, the, those little parentheses is how I tell it, this is what this chunk is, and I'm going to um, then do something with this chunk. Or I'm going to print this chunk, or I'm not going to print this chunk. And so, so I use those those elements to group. Um, anchors are the the little carrot and the dollar sign. I remember, dollar signs and carrots they have lots and lots of meaning in regular expression. When they're outside of values, the carrot means the start of a field. The dollar sign means the end of a field. Um, so, unfortunately, they, they they like to reuse these things. Uh, qualifiers, so that's going to be how greedy are my regular expressions going to be? Uh, question mark would be, I, 
uh, it's a single, is it, it does, is this character actually there, match it or don't match it? A plus sign is going to be um, a, a match plus. Uh, a little uh, asterisk is a wild card, take as many of this particular character or character classes forward. And then you'll see me use this a lot. The little, um, the little uh, jaggedy parentheses with a number in the middle, that's telling it I want to match this many characters. So whenever the character is in front, take the number of characters after that. Um, and so you see that a lot of the examples that I use, especially for um, capturing the field. And then if I don't care about indicators, I will take any of the four characters afterwards. But I, I'm not really matching on them, but I can, I can, I can, I can get them. So, so that's there. And then substitutions is how we replace things. So once you group them, you have to replace them. So that's a dollar sign and a number. Or in the case where the, um, the regular expression would, the answer would be a number, you can actually name your group, which I don't know if I have an example of, but we'll see. All right, so I have some examples um, of how this works. I hope that my mind's kind of open this window. Can we open this window? Ah, we can. Thank you. The only problem with being in a room with a lot of computers. Let's keep. All right. So we're going to look at we're going to look at three examples of, of different uh, things that are going to be regular expressions, which are somewhat simple expressions, but they're going to be. Um, let's look at different concepts for how we do grouping the other. So we have. Um, an example where we're going to add a period to the end of a field, and this is a question that comes up on the market at Listserv all the time. Um, I have a field, um, I need to add a period to it, but I only need to add a period to this particular field or under these particular, um, uh, under, and I don't want to add a period to all the fields because other fields may have periods in them all. All right, so only ones that don't have periods. Uh, we will look at how to place content in between subfields. So in this case, we're going to add um, uh, a, uh, a subfield H um, in between uh, two values um, in an example. And then we're going to take um, a, uh, a record that has two um, URLs in it and split it into two separate fields. So we can do that with regular expressions. We'll, we'll do each of those three. All right, so I have in the data files that I, I, I told you that I said you could download, um, we have here uh, data, and I moved right down. I wrote down the names of which files I was using. Um, it's the one that's called sample records, and I have the .mrk is the one that's already been processed. Oh, let me make these bigger so you can see. Again, I like very small fonts, and I, I get to... Uh, <laughs> I, I, it's, a, it's something that um, I get I tell people tell me fonts are too small, I can't see them, so I would get uh, bigger font, bigger font. Uh, so, what's that font? Are you sure that many people downloaded the data file? Did people download the data no. file? If you want to, do you want me to put, this, put it back up again? Yes. I will put it back up if you want to follow it. Sorry, yes. Thank you, Eric. All right. All right, so again, I'll, I'll wait a second in case you want to follow along, because the idea is that uh, um, you can follow along or not. Um, I think there's a, there is um, a value to it. Um, but the data files um, are, are here um, at that URL.
The first thing that, um, make sure this these are the right records. All right, wait a second. Maybe they're not the record. Which record was it? One second. I, I was positive that was the right set of records.
I want a second one. I'm going to create a second one. And this one's going to have a period in it because I want to make sure that I can see the difference. So I'm going to say this is my second one. Uh, we'll have the 500. But I am going to call it, this is field two. So that's going to be my second field. It's going to have a period at the end. That way we can see for a regular expression how we differentiate between records that have fields that have punctuation at the end and ones that don't. Um, so what we're doing is we're going to use a regular expression to show how to, how to determine when there's punctuation at the end and not. Because um, in Mark 21, there's many fields that should have punctuation. And if they don't, then you want to be able to put it back. And you don't want to put double punctuation on the field that already has it. Yeah. So in this case, we're going to do a second one. And so we'll put a, our period there. And then we'll go ahead and add that field. And when we're done, what we have is we have two fields that have been added. I will highlight them. Uh, we will have a 500 that has uh, field 2 and one that says field 1. Uh, field 2 has a period in it, and field 1 does not. All right. So we're all on the same place. No. No, not here. Yes. No, not here. What? You must go slower. Okay. You must go much slower. Much slower. Much, much slower. Okay. Okay. Um, I don't know where to try to help you. Yeah, much go much slower. Okay. Speak much slower. Okay. <laughs> Make sure they're all on the same page. They're all on the same page. Okay. Now you can focus. Okay. Okay. So, so are we in? No, I'm sure it's not. Yes. So that way it's easier for everybody to see. And I'm going to make this box very big. Sure. All right. So if this is, if these are our two fields here, I'm just going to put these out of the program so that we can see them. All right. So if this is the field that we have here, all right, what we need to do is we need to match it. 
So the first thing we're going to do in a regular expression is we need to tell the program that we're looking for the, the 500 field. That's our first thing that we need to do. So we're going to create a group. Those parentheses, we need to create a group that captures that field. And so to do that initial group, we're going to put a parentheses which says start a group. We're going to use equal 500, which says um, we're looking for the 500 field. And now we have a couple of different ways we can do this. Um, do we want to have, um, do we care about the rest of the information in, in the field, or do we just care about the period at the end? At this point, we just care about the period at the end, so we can make this really simple. So what we're going to do is we're going to put a period, and a period in a regular expression means any character. So I'm going to set the yeah, wild card. So I'm going to put a period, and then I'm going to put the little asterisk, which says match forever. And then I am going to tell it, what am I going to tell it? Uh, I'm going to say uh, bracket. So I'm, I'm telling it now. We're looking for a range of characters. I'm going to put a little caret, which says does not match. Because I'm saying I don't want to match a particular character. And I'm going to put that period, again, except inside the brackets now. It doesn't mean any character. It means the actual period. So again, this is where it gets confusing, unfortunately. So it does not match a period. And then I'm going to close the bracket and put a dollar sign at the end. So I want it to match the very end of the field. So that's my, that's my expression. I'm going to say, uh, I'm looking for the 500 field. Um, I want it to capture all of the data in that field, but I'm only going to match if the last character in my field is not period. So that way, I should match only on this field, but not the one above it, because the one above it is going to end in period. So let's see if that is actually what happens. Uh, because again, um, I, uh, uh, I I don't do regular expressions right very uh, often. So let's try it. So what we'll do is we will go to um, the replace function here, uh, and the replace function from our window is under uh, edit. So it's the second menu item. Edit. Yeah. So it's uh, it's the second menu item. Edit. And then it's under replace. All right. And in the the what we just wrote, this piece that we just wrote here, our expression. We're going to copy this. I'm going to take this expression and I'm going to put that into the first box, the find box. <laughs> so in the first box in my regular in my first box in find, and I, I apologize that it's very small because of the screen. In the first box, that that. Uh, this, this here that we wrote, I'm putting that in that box. All right. So are we all in the same spot at this point? All right. We all in the, are we all in the same spot? Okay. So we have written the expression for how we're going to match the field. Now we have to write the result so that we get back the period at the end. So um, all we've done is we 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 found the field that we want. Now we have to tell it how to put the period at the end. So that is much easier. Um, we have those parentheses, which are creating a group. 
And so what we're going to do is we're going to reference that group. Um, and we do that. Um, <coughs> new line. We reference those parentheses. Each one of those is a number. Each time you see a grouped element, that's a 1 or a 2 or a 3. Um, in this case, that is a 1. So we will reference it by using a dollar sign, which says, I am looking now at a group. And this is only in the, 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 the replace part. Uh, after I found it, now when I do the replacement, I, I use a dollar sign to say this group. And it's going to be group 1, um, because that's the group we're working with. And then we're going to put a period at the end because that's the value that we're going to be adding to it. So what it's going to do is it's going to capture that that dollar sign one stands in for the entire field that we just captured. And then we put a period at the end, which is going to put that piece of punctuation that we're missing into the field that's not there. And so where we put that is that dollar sign one period goes into the second box in our replace function. That replace with. That's where we will put the dollar sign one period. I want to just one question. Yes. Dollar one means what I found. That's right. That is that first group. That first thing in front. That's right. Yes. And if we had two parentheses, the second one would be a dollar sign too. Okay. Uh, yes. Okay. Okay. All right. So we have we have our our very simple expression. Um, in Mark Edit, we check a box. That second box there that says use regular expression. That tells it that we're using the special syntax. And then we go ahead and use replace all, the, that button right there. And it tells us it made modifications. It says eight. Um, that must mean that there might have been data in the record already. But we can check. We can check. Let's look. Let's see what happens. All right. So let's look. So we ran our we ran our change. So this is our regular set now. So we took that that data field that didn't have a period. Did it work? Oh, let's see why it did not.
I'm not going anywhere. Uh, feel free to ask, uh, but we probably should, should move along a little bit. And we will see more of them, unfortunately. Uh, so that's kind of what we do. All right. So in the slides, um, in the slides, what you're going to be able to do is we'll, we'll skip the other two expressions. But in the slides, we've done one. Um, I included um, examples of how each one works for the things that we wanted to do and an explanation of why they work. So in this case, if you were to look at the slides, you would see that the expression that I wrote in the slides is different than the one that we just used. And I actually, I might not, I probably should have done this, but I like to do this because one of the things that I, I like to let people understand is there are lots of ways to write your expression. Um, it's not a one-size-fits-all, and part of learning how to use regular expressions is to figure out what style is going to work best for you. Um, so we provided that, I provided an example that just grabbed everything and look at the end. In this case, I broke it, in the example that I have in the slides, I broke it into two groups. I didn't have to, obviously, but I did. Um, if you look at the other examples, you will see again um, how you can take uh, data and create groups and break them up. Uh, but rather than go through and do those, we will, uh, I'll leave these examples for you to look at. And uh, if you have questions, uh, you can feel free to ask. And if this is something you're really interested in, please, uh, I, I'm not going anywhere. I'm, I'm here. Feel free to, to grab it. But we probably should, uh, should go on. Um, so if you want to learn more about regular expressions, these are uh, pages that I point people to, especially when they're first starting out um, in Mark Edit, that should help get you kind of going along the, the way. There's a 30-minute tutorial uh, that will show you how to use regular expressions generally, so you can learn the language constructs. Um, and then there's kind of the, the how.net kind of works with regular expressions. All right. So specific things that I wanted to make sure we cover uh, before we get into the questions. Um, I want to talk about character conversions because character conversions are something, like I said, that I, well, actually, I should just ask, maybe it doesn't matter to you. Do you deal with characters, do you deal with files that are of different character sets where it would be important to be able to move data from Seeing some yeses and some noes. Okay, so I will go over it kind of quickly. Um, so that the way that Mark, so the way that uh, Marquette handles this um, is that you have the ability to move data from um, one type of data to another. Um, I have an example. Um, so uh, I'm just going to show you this example. So so um, so this is this file here. Um, that, that I'm going to open really quick. Let me open it really fast here. Uh, this file is a Big Five file. Uh, Big Five is a character set that's used in um, Asian countries. It's one that if you work with a lot of Asian countries who aren't doing data in Unicode, you may actually see. Um, when you open this file in MarkEdit, uh, it looks like this, which is really useless. Uh, you, it's, it's got little the little brackety things, which shows that those are diacritics, but they're, they're diacritics that you can't see. It's, it would be relatively useless. Um, now, if you had a, a library system that wanted either market data or Unicode data, and you took this file and loaded it, it would look like a mess. Obvious. The, the diacritics wouldn't show, it wouldn't look like uh, Chinese, which is what this is. Um, so we need to convert it. We need to take this data and turn it into Unicode. So in MarkEdit, underneath Tools, there is a thing called Character Conversions. And there are two tools in the Character Conversions tool. One of them allows you to detect a character set. So let's say I get a file, and I don't know what character set it is. I don't know what the file is. Somebody just gave me a file. I tried to open it or load it into my ILS and it looked crazy. It just did not look right. But I don't know why it looked right. There's a tool that will allow you to run that file through a processor and tell you what the format of the file is. There is another tool that allows you to change the format. So that's what we're going to look at. So 
This one here, the first one, it's called character conversion. This is how we change data from one format to another. All right, so the character conversions tool asks you for some stuff. It asks you what is your file to start with, what is the file that it starts with, and, and what do you want it to end up in. So I have a file that's in big five format, and I want to turn it into Unicode. So the process of doing that is basically just pointing to the file that I'm starting with. Let's see if I can make this screen a little bigger. Let me go crazy on the uh, I might be able to make this bigger. Yes. Yeah, so the, so we're looking at the big five file. So so this is how we're gonna convert that big five file. So that big five file should look like a mess if you were to open it in the mark editor. So here we're gonna take that big five file and we're gonna convert it to something that's useful. So I will select my file, my big five file. and put it into the source. So there's my, here in a second, there's my big five file. That's the big five file that I, just, I opened that did not look good. Um, and I'm gonna create a new file from it. I'm gonna call it uh, big five uh, UTFA. Um, doesn't matter what I'm calling it, but that's what I'm gonna call it so that I know what it is. Very many people are very close. And when they get to that dialog box, yes. They need to know what files are open. Got a source file. Yes, so the source file should be the one that says big5.mrc. That's going to be inside the data file. Inside the inside that data folder that you downloaded, um, it's the big5.mrc file. That's the one that's going to go into the source. Yes. Do we have the right file? Sorry. So it's. What's the name you need for the new file? Uh, you can call it whatever you want. I call it Big Five U T F A. Just that I knew what, what the new file was. Yeah. Okay. So are we have we found the So my
I'm going to select UTF-8. So when my thing is done, it will look like this. I'll have my source file, which is the big five file. I'll have my destination file, which goes to a different file, but it's going to be whatever, wherever I save it. Um, the original is going to be big five. The destination is Unicode. And when I'm finished and I'm happy with that, I tell it to process, and I get a box here that should tell me um, that I have converted that data file into a specific location. All right. So, so if you run it and you've gotten that box, okay. So we run it. We've gotten that box. So what did we just do? All right. So let's let me show you what we just did. All right. So this again is what we started with. This mess. This mess here is what we started with. That was the big five file that, that we would not be able to use in our catalog. All right. The file that I just processed, which I don't know where I put it. Uh, just this, where did I put it? I think I put it on my desktop. One second. Uh, the file, yeah, here we go. So the file I just processed, which is on my desktop. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to open that file again. And so. I'm going to break it into the mark edit format. So, uh, so I'm going to run it through the mark editor. I'm going to break it here. All right. And, and you, if you use mark edit, you understand what I'm doing here. Mark tools. I open mark tools. I select the, the .mrc file. And I'm going to break it into a .mrc file. So I run that. And I look at it. And now, the data is in Chinese. It's taken that data from the squiggly lines in the Big Five format that I couldn't use and it's turned it into a character set that I can't use. So. Alright, 
Make sense? Does that work? Okay. Okay, so did everybody understand how we got from the .mrc file to the .mrk so we could see it? Uh, I'm assuming every most everybody's used more than the same audience. Okay, great. All right. Okay, so that's how we do character conversion. That's a very simple example because it's the one that I happen to see most often. Uh, but like I said, Mark Edit can process lots and lots of different file types. And in fact, there are times where you may run across character sets that no longer exist. Um, I had that happen. And when it does, let me know, and sometimes we can accommodate it. I'm not going to ask you to open it, but let me show you what I mean. Um, in the character conversion tool, and this is why I asked um, one of our French colleagues if, if they'd seen this before, um, I had had uh, a, a number of small libraries ask about a character set that's called ISO 5426. It no longer exists. It was used a very long time ago as a local script for um, French and does not exist anymore. There's not programs to translate it. They had a library system that was stuck in it and they needed to convert it to human code. It was a very simple process to call the ISO folks, get the full, get the, the paper that I needed and write the conversion so that we can process it. So, uh, it is possible to add new conversions to the tool if we need to. Okay. Um, I will, since we all have, know where our big five file format is, our big five file is, um, I'll show you the character detection and then we'll move on. Um, if I did not know that the file that I gave, if you didn't know that the file I gave you was a big five file, let's say I just gave you that big five file and told you, turn it into Unicode. Um, and you didn't know, looking at it, what a big file, five file format would look like. How would you know how to do that? Well, Mark Edit needs you to tell it what the character format is. In the tool, there is a process for automatically figuring out what your character the character format is. It's under tools, character conversion, and character detection. This is a special tool that I will admit is not perfect like anything. It's really a guesstimate. It uses the same process as web browsers use when they read a page to determine how to render it back to a user. They try to figure out what language it is uh, based on characteristics of the data. So if I open this tool and I select my big five file that I just processed a second, the, the one that I know is in big five, my big five.mrc file, let's say I pick that file, I, I select that file. Yes, yes. Okay, so if we select the file that we work with, that big five file, and, and I'm going to tell you, um, uh, we selected it. If we click the detect button now, we, we selected the big five, the, the original five. big five, oh, yes, yes. the big five dot MRC file, the one that we know is in big five format. But let's say I didn't know it was in big five format. I want to find out what format that is. I would select the file and tell it to detect. And what I get is an output that looks like this that tells me two things. It tells me that the file is in these. These formats, uh, GB18, blah, 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 and big five. Um, that is interesting. It tells me it thinks there's two different file formats that the, the record is in. It's not. There's actually just big five. Uh, this is, this, I use this because 
what this is telling me is that it thinks that it's Chinese, basically. These are two Chinese character sets. Um, and so um, I now have a guesstimate of what the file type is. So I can actually try and translate against these two until I get the one that's right. Um, and so that gives me a way to start to figure out what it is that I'm being given um, to be able to work with. Uh, Okay, are we ready to move on to the next one? Does that make sense? Are you able to figure out where we're at? Yes, exactly. Yes, yes. Come on. Okay. All right, so let's go ahead and move on uh, to the next part. And I'm going to, let's see. We're going to uh, skip one of these, I think. Um, let's see what time it is. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to ask, and we'll take a quick survey to see if we're going to skip the next part. Um, so uh, we're, I, I think we might want to get into the question. So how often do you need to take mark records and create reports, well, not reports, um, uh, like a spreadsheet to give somebody. You need to give them a, a spreadsheet of titles. Okay, so you, you would like you would like to know. That. Okay, all right. So this is this is this is actually really straightforward. So MarkEdit has a tool that allows you to take mark records and turn it into a set of um, like common delimited files, which can be opened in Excel. Um, and this gets used. Where we're at, because sometimes we buy our stuff, and we need to give people a report of what's in that bucket. So, um, so that's what this tool's for. All right, we will find this tool uh, when we open Mark Edit up, and we have the main window page. If we select the tools, and then the export, we will see something that's called export tab delimited. And so that's how we export tab delimited records. Um, what it doesn't do, what it does not do, um, because people ask me sometimes if it does this, you cannot just point that tool at Mark Edit and say export everything as a, as a Excel sheet. It doesn't work that way. You have to tell it which fields you want to export into your report. So if we walk through this process, we'll select export. So we have uh, our window here. We can select a file. So you've downloaded your, we have our set of, of sample files. So um, we're going to take a, one of these MRC files. Um, I'm going to take the one that says OCLC records. So I'm going to select OCLC records as my as the file set I'm going to work with. Um, I then have to set a save file. This is the the delimited file that's going to get created for me. So wherever you want to put it, I'm going to put mine on the desktop. And I'm going to call mine um, just uh, 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 output. So it's going to be called output.txt. So that's where I'm going to put it. You can put it wherever you'd like to put it. And then I tell Mark Edit how would I like my delimited format to look. I prefer tab delimited, so that's the one that shows up in the box. It's the tab delimited. But you can use other delimiters. In the drop-down box, you can select a different one. I, I find tab to be the one I, I'm most comfortable with. Um, and the second option, which is says in-field delimiter, what that means is if I select a field where there are two fields in my records, let's say I take subjects, there are two 650 fields and I pick that, it will create a single column and it will use that value as a, a second delimiter. Because Excel, you can tell Excel when you open it that I to, to, to break on a second delimiter. 
So, so that's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to leave all that stuff as is, and then I'm going to tell it next. Okay. So now I just need to tell MarketEdit what data I want to export into my spreadsheet, and I do that by putting information. I do that by putting information into these boxes. So here I have field and subfield. So I enter in the field that I want. So let's say we want to take the title and just the subfield A, not the whole title, just the subfield A. So I would put in 245 in the field, and I would put A into the subfield. So that would tell it that I'm only going to take the 245 subfield A, and then I would click the add field button. And that puts that argument into my list. So if I want to add another field, let's say I want to take um, as well the 856. Yes, so let's say 856, and I'm going to take the subfield U. So I would put that in and my add field. So I can create whatever I need in my report. And if I need just the, if I need a, a control field, so let's say I want the OCLC number. In my world, OCLC number is very important. Um, I would put 001 and no subfield, uh, and that would take just the, the control box. Okay, so are we have all the same ones. Yes. You can add as many fields as you want. The, there is a, the, the actual theoretical limit of the number of fields you can add in that box is somewhere around 64,000. Um, I don't think there are that many more. So in reality, you put as many as you want. Yeah. So, so I'm just going to use these two um, to start with. Okay, so before we, before we finish and push the export button, one more thing. All right. Let's say you need to write this report a lot. You, you, people are always asking you for this, this report. You're always going to be creating this thing. Uh, rather than having to do this over and over and over again, this little uh, settings option here, if you click on it, you will see a drop-down box that has three options. One is load settings, one is save settings, and one is clear settings. If I wanted to save all of those options, I would click save settings, and it would save it as a file Then I could load back later. So when I came back to it, rather than having to recreate my arguments, I would just tell it to load that file, and then I'm done, and then I just tell it to export. All right. Okay, so I have my, my drop-down list of materials. When I'm done, I click export, and that generates the file that I, I asked it to create. So where I told it to save the file, that's what gets created. So my output file got created. So if I look at it, here's my output file. Terry. Yes. Once they export the file. Yes. How do they open it? Yes. So once you export the file, you close the window, <laughs> and then you would open that file probably in Excel or in uh, a notepad. So I'm just opening it in Notepad, but I would open it in Excel. No, in words, they have to, they have to go to like Windows Explorer. Yes, exactly. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. exactly. So once you've exported it, so I saved it into my. It's on my desktop. So then I would have to go to my desktop and open it in Excel or whatever. And so. So this is so this is just that file um, exported in Notepad. So you can see the tab delinea delineations. So you can see the title and the URL. So so this allows me to have my report. All right. So did you want to finish it? Oh, you lost your file. Oh, you lost your file. So we're going to update. So we can export it. There we go. Okay. 
So are we all in a all in a good spot? Yes. No. Okay. I think we are. I'm not very okay. Okay. So we. How many like was where email should be? Uh, eight, six, something like that. It was a small number, and there weren't all. All of them didn't have URLs. It was just a small number of records. Yes, uh huh. Uh huh. Yes, and try to uh import the uh find it through the menu. It's under add-ins and delimited text translator. And this opens up a, a special wizard that allows, will help you walk through the process of taking an Excel file or a tab delimited file and turning it into Mark. Uh, you can use an access database actually. Um, you can either use an access database or an Excel file or a um, uh, like the text document we just exported. You can take those and reassemble them back in the mark. Just an access table. Uh, just an access table, yes. You can't do the whole database. You'd have to, yes, yes, yes. Oh, yes, yes, yes. All right. So, um, what I'm going to do is. Uh, is uh, I'm going to leave this uh, rather than walking through the whole thing. Uh, if this is something you're interested in, we're going to take a break here in a couple minutes. Come and let me know, and we'll walk through it on my computer so we can go through it together. Because unfortunately, there's a lot of stuff there that's potentially 
um, difficult because you have to join data together. So rather than do it for everybody, if you're not interested, I don't want to take, I don't want to um, uh, confuse folks. But I want you to know that it's here. I also like you to know that if it's something that you find, like let's say a week from now, you think, man, I really want to know how to do that. There are four YouTube tutorials that show exactly how this works, step to step. So you can walk through and watch it on your own um, if you want to. But when we take our break, if you really want to see it, come up and I will do that. All right. So that gets us to the questions, and it also puts us at a time where I'm going to give us a short break, a little bit of a break to, to take a break. So let's say like 10 minutes. Let's take like 10 minutes. Uh, get coffee, uh, water, um, use the restroom if you need to, um, and then we will come back and we will go through the questions. And like I said, if you're interested in knowing how to do the Excel translation, just come on up here and I'll walk you through it on my computer. Okay. Into a format 
that's in the mnemonic format that people work with. So when you save, it saves it back to mark XML. So that way, if you don't want to deal with the XML, you can work with it in the more familiar format. So it's, um, it works fine with you, but it doesn't, um, because remember, market is agnostic, so it doesn't actually care. All my examples are in Mark 21, but if I had to mark, they would just be field numbers and you can work with them the exact same way. Yes, yes. Yes, my library will only support the open access. Okay. So uh, when we do the open access, we play with the catalog. But unfortunately, we don't control the URI, so the URI is the So you know, what we would like to do is to check that we can use my editor to uh, download the whole uh, non-URI uh, and all powers. Yes. Yes. Let me show you. Um, so there is an URL checker in Market. Oh. It is under Added and Verify URLs. And so if I open that, and I'll let's see, we did have a record set with URLs. So we just grab that one. The OCLC one had a couple of URLs. In it. So we can pick the file that we want to work with. Um, it's taking me a minute. My, my computer is wonky because it's network to work there, but keeps on trying to talk to it. I can create my report, and my report can be in either HTML, um, XML, or yeah, HTML or XML. So probably HTML is what you're going to use. Um, the title, you can output the title, yes. and then it'll give you the URL as well. Mm -hmm. And then I tell it what I want to process. So in this case, by default, I do all fields because I find a lot of times you put URLs into notes. And I would like to know if those are valid. Uh, but if you want to just look at a specific field, you can take away the all and just put 856 and it'll hold it on the So I, I do this, and then I tell it to OK. And it goes and starts checking. Uh, records and it's looking for URLs and when it's done um, it finishes how uh, our connection here is um, how many records I have in that particular file yeah yeah so they have a it's really popular because it's a very unfortunately it's one of those processes yeah, anyway, so this is the general. So it's got around. So I can see the title, the URL, and it gets to a status. It tells you if it's a 200 or if it's a, a 440, so connected. Or, yeah, yeah. So, so it'll give you back that, that report there and tell you what there. Here's our report. So we got back status code. So in this case, um, it tells us the status message is found, and the status code is 302, which means it's been moved. But that might be okay. It might just be a redirection. And so we might yes, be okay. That that. Yeah, so we might be okay with that. We might not. These records don't link because um, they're too, they're fake, or they're being in their proxy, and I can't connect from here. Um, so this tells me that stuff. And these tell me all the ones that connected are fine. Mm -hmm. And so that way, I can um, do that really quickly. This is in the HTML report, but in the XML report. Okay, uh, I um, I have not set it up for Excel, but um, can I, I take the XML? You could, yeah. You could take the XML and set it. But I but, but I can actually, uh, before I leave today, I can even uh, uh, add another drop down and we'll let it be like a tab link. Of course, yes. you could have title, URL, status yes. code, and I more than that. Yes, and then delete the all the Yeah, because that way you can easily sort. Uh, oh, I thought the minutes, and I will. Oh, it, it's actually a really easy thing to do. Um, I call it uploaded to like a back home because uh, the. Uh, I'm not so much in that. <laughs> Okay, this will be very useful because I think I can set an excel and a 
I, uh, I, I appreciate Eric. I, 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 um, I, when I put these things, uh, I get to where I talk very, very fast because there's uh, a lot of stuff to get through. <laughs>
Okay, so I think we're gonna get started again. Um, I have my my phone set to let me know when we're at one o'clock, so I don't uh, eat into um, into lunch time. We have. Uh, I went through and I quickly looked at my slides. We have two questions. Um, I don't think that we're going to get through all of them, so I may uh, jump through a couple. There are ones that I want to make sure we go through uh, for sure, just to make sure we're all on the same page. So um, I think that's how we're going to do it. So uh, and if you see if we if I skip a question that uh, you're particularly interested in, um, you can let me know, and I will be happy to show you later. All right, so the first thing I want to start with, because it's already been asked once here, um, is, uh, is in working in the MARC editor, what the heck do you like the save buttons and stuff do? Because sometimes folks don't understand how to get from, I, I have a MARC file, I want to edit it, and I want to get it back into something I can actually put into my catalog. So I want to make sure everybody knows how to do that, at least. <laughs> All right, so we have in our data file, different file types. They're in the data file, you see, well, you may or may not be able to see it actually, depending on what Windows shows you. Um, you'll see icons. Um, there will be a purple icon, uh, which is a .mrc file, which in mark edit means that this is the extension I use to represent mark files. Binary mark. That's the file you would load into your catalog. Um, in mark edit these, there's these things called mnemonic files. That's the notepad like file that you read when you open it into the mark editor. And that icon is blue, I think. Yes. It's not on my computer, so I forget all the time. That icon is blue, and it's got a dot mrk extension. Okay? So when I'm working with the Mark Editor, I have two ways to open files into the Mark Editor to edit them. I can go through the process. So I have I have a, a .mrc file right here. So let's say this is the file my vendor's giving me. I have two ways I can get to start editing it and then and then working with it. The first way, which is the way I 